talk about uh, management of one lung anesthesia and uh, and lung and thoracic <laughs> surgery. A lot of this stuff we will have covered already last week because we talked about assessment of the pulmonary surgical patients. So a lot of this stuff is going to sound very um, uh, familiar to you. Start out with a little um, laryngospasms. You know those guys? The laryngospasms? <laughs> they, they're a group of uh, nurse anesthetists. They, they live in Minnesota. I know, I know a couple of those guys personally. And they have CDs of, they do all these sort of cover songs, but with, the, you know, take commonly known songs, but add anesthesia related lyrics to them. It's really fun. As your song breathe. So when we think about our thoracic patient, our one lung surgery patient, the, the, this is the primary issue, which is what? Right. We've got V and Q on one side, and we've got Q on the other side. And very obviously, we, we end up with a VQ mismatch um, because we're, we're not ventilating one side, we're ventilating the other side of the lung. So very clearly, that's the, the central issue that, uh, that we have. Um, now, I'm not going to go all the way around the clock here on this, um, on, on the history thing, although I'll tell you a couple things that are sort of interesting. So um, the idea about doing one lung anesthesia might sound like, oh, that's probably, you know, we discovered anesthesia and discovered how to ventilate people and then, you know, thought about doing this other thing. Actually, it goes back to 1893. A guy named Fell invented this device and then another guy named O'Dwyer refined it or added some refinements to it. And they demonstrated this in 1893 at, at the World Congress, at the International Congress. Uh, as a means of ventilating patients. It looks like a jet ventilator, right? They would hold that thing right over the, uh, over the glottis, stomp on the bellows, you know, and kind of shoot air down into the, into the trachea to ventilate patients. That was in 1893. By 1899, they had, someone had performed a, a thoracotomy using this device. So people were like, let's do it, let's do it. Um, but of course, as you can imagine, you know, it, it was not very uh, clean or very pretty. And because, uh, you know, they weren't really isolating the lungs, uh, you know, they didn't have, you know, and, and stand there and do that for as long as that would take, you know, it, not a very uh, nice thing. So it wasn't really until we had muscle relaxants, you know, primarily and, and better devices that people actually started doing uh, one lung anesthesia as more than just sort of a curiosity. Um, 1928, uh, Goodell, McGill, Waters, other pioneers, those names that you might recognize from like your Goodell Airway and your McGill forceps and all those things, um, achieved closed endotracheal anesthesia. So this is the first time someone kind of figured out how to put a tube in, in the trachea and, and do that. Again, it wasn't. It was only a few years later, it was 1932, that uh, Joseph Gale and Ralph Waters did endobronchial anesthesia. So it was very early on that we went from regular intubation and, and endotracheal anesthesia to one lung anesthesia. At the time, the idea was not uh, about doing a lot of, of thoracic, uh, like lung resections. What do you, why do you think they had this impetus to try to get into one lung? What was going on at that time? Tuberculosis, yeah, tuberculosis and empyemas and things like that is, is where they really had this kind of impetus to try to um, to get in there and, and you know deal with one lung. First bronchial blocker was used in 1936, um, and that was just a rubber tube with an inflatable cuff shoved down one bronchus. Uh, in 1950, Carlin's came out with what we sort of have today, the, the design that we sort of have today, with you know one endobronchial lumen, one um, tracheal lumen, all incorporated in one cuff. And that Carlin's tube had a, a carinal hook on it. So that little nub that's hanging out there, the little uh, orange one that's, that's hanging out over here, it's called a carinal hook that's meant to hook the carina, just as the name implies, and, and tell you that you're in the right place. Nasty, right? Can't be. Okay, <laughs> that's not very stimulating to the patient. Um, he had the first right-sided tube in 1960. In 1962, Robert Shaw uh, came up with, with the tubes that we use today. And, and this design, as you can recognize here, although it's you know, refined a little bit, uh, is really kind of the, the modern um, uh, uh, iteration of the endobronchial tube. People were using Fogarty catheters in the 80s, and then uh, Inouye and, and colleagues um, came out with the Univent tube in 1982, which was the first time someone took a single tube with a bronchial blocker uh, incorporated into it. And then, uh, and then there was a number of other um, uh, versions of that along the way. So the ARNT bronchial blocker is a a, uh, a blocker that is placed through, use a regular endotracheal tube, but then this blocker gets, is a, a fiber optic guided blocker. So you put the fiber optic down whatever bronchus you want, this uh, blocker is already kind of looped around it, and then you, you slide it off the end of your uh, fiber optic so scope, and it's going to end up then in the uh, correct bronchus. 
um, there's a flux chip blocker, a steerable blocker that uh, Cohen came out with in, in uh, 2005, and, and so that's where some of the, the um, uh, research is going these days in terms of new developments of, of these things. So let's talk about um, pre-op evaluation of these patients. So, and again, a lot of the stuff we talked about um, last week, right? So we're going to look, of course, for the usual conditions. We're going to think about what, what brought the person here in the first place. Um, COPD, remember the associated diseases like uh, myasthenic syndrome, looking for signs of pulmonary hypertension, P. pulmonale, all those sort of things. The site of the surgery is going to make a difference. When we're anticipating how much of a, uh, how difficult a time we have in maintaining oxygenation, if you think about going back to the anatomy we talked about, the right lung is bigger than the left side, left side is carved out for the heart to fit in there, and so oxygenation is better during left thoracotomy. Does that make sense? I'll think about that. Does that make sense? Oxygenation is better during the left thoracotomy. If the right lung is bigger, that means that, relatively speaking, if you're operating on the right lung, you're not ventilating, but you still have some perfusion, but it's bigger, so relatively speaking, you've got more perfusion, so the oxygenation usually stays better on the left side because there's less of a, of a uh, mismatch between the V and the Q. Um, spirometry, we talked about this last week, really has fairly limited um, predictive value. Uh, we did say that the resting AVG is, is pretty predictive if hypoxemia is present, and especially if, if they'll drop their saturation with a little bit of exertion, usually is, is a pretty bad sign. Surgical position makes a difference. So in the patient who's lateral versus the patient who's supine, where do you think you have better matching of V and Q during one lung ventilation? What do you think? Lateral, yeah. Because if you think about that, what we said that the Q usually follows what? Gravity, right? Q usually follows gravity. So in the patient who's lateral, the side that you're ventilating is where? Down toward gravity, right? That means the Q is going to go where? Down toward gravity. And so you bring the V and the Q together. If you have a patient that for some reason if you're doing a, a, a thoracotomy, a one lung uh, procedure because maybe a, let's say they're going to do an esophagectomy, say, for cancer, and the surgeon says, let's just have the patient flat, now what you're going to have is this lung is not going to be ventilated at all, but you're going to have an even distribution, more even distribution of the Q across both sides, and so then the VQ uh, match uh, comes off, uh, gets, gets a little bit set off. Um, we talked about perfusion scans and split lung function tests last, uh, last week. Remember the, um, I think I mentioned this too, that, that the size of the tumor or the extent of the surgery also plays a role in, in kind of predicting how well the patient's oxygenation is going to stand up. So a bigger surgery is usually actually better because if you're talking about a big, huge tumor that they're taking out, the perfusion is probably already really messed up in that area. So you don't have as much of a, this is a great perfect lung that we stopped ventilating, but, but we're still perfusing. It's like it was already not being perfused very well, and when we take the ventilation away, it, it's not as much of a, of a mismatch from where they started out. Um, so, and then in, in contrasting then the, uh, let's see, this was the positioning uh, and where the, where the PA, PO2 goes related to positioning. And then the one I want to show you is this one. It shows the mean PO2 uh, versus the type of procedures. And so you'll see that pneumonectomy patients actually have a higher PO2 than someone who's just having like a little wedge resection of a, of a metastatic uh, cancer, which probably makes sense if you think about it, because if you're doing a whole pneumonectomy, what, what's the surgeon going to do that's going to help you out greatly? They're gonna, yeah, they're, they're going to clamp that pulmonary artery. They're going to they're get rid of all the Q on that side. You've already stopped ventilating, and then you get rid of the, the perfusion, and now everything's back to, to uh, being matched up. Um, when I said that, that spirometry has predictive value, one thing that's sort of interesting is that, um, is that if you look here, so this is PO2 over time in one lung ventilation, and uh, I'll just call your attention to the blue line and then the, the middle sort of orangish line there. So the blue line is supine patient with COPD versus a semilateral patient with, um, uh, or, or sup let's say this one, sorry, blue and yellow one, supine with COPD versus supine with normal PFTs. So the FEV1, if that's reduced, the first thing that comes to mind is what? FEV1 is reduced. You start thinking about obstruction, right? It, it, we're going to assume they probably had a normal volume. They couldn't get it out. And that, I said, has a variable value in terms of predictiveness because on some hands, for obvious reasons, you say they've got bad lungs, that they're going to have a hard time keeping their oxygenation up. Sometimes that's good. How can that be good? If, if they have obstructive disease, how might that be good in this case when we're doing one lung ventilation? How is it that, that these patients with COPD keep their, keep their PO2 up higher than some patients with normal PFTs who are undergoing one lung anesthesia? 
Yeah. Because we said the problem is that you have, in, you have in no ventilation, but you have in continued perfusion over there. If they've got obstructive disease, inherently that means that what's happening? Some of that air is staying behind, right? And if those alveoli are staying aerated to some extent, then over the course of you know 30 minutes or so here, as, as you see in this data, there, that, that little bit of perfusion that continues, now the HPV is going to cut that down somewhat, right? So HPV is going to try and help to cut that down. But that little bit of perfusion that persists is going to still experience some gas sitting in those uh, kind of trapped gas in those alveoli that it can, that it can pick up. Right, right, because they've got some air trapping that's, that's, that's occurred there. Um, so, you know, the, the assessment of, of pulmonary risk, um, and it kind of comes down to this. If you think about this three-legged stool, these three um, uh, various pieces of that are the FEV1, which says how well do you get the gas in the lungs, right? How well are you moving gas in and out? The diffusing capacity says what's going on at that alveolar capillary level. And then that VO2 says how well are you using the oxygen in the end. So if you had any three things that you would want to look at to get a sense of, of how the patient is going to do, those three pieces really kind of in, encompass that entire picture, right? And we wanted that, that VO2, remember, to be high because remember these patients that have really severe disease, they, they can generate a lot of oxygen usage because the, the entire system is not working. So that number should be high. All right, so then let's talk about tubes. Who's done one lung? Who's done one lung cases? I think Melissa probably has by this point, right? So, um, what kind of tube have you used? The, you've used a bronchial blocker. Have you used a double lumen? Yeah. How many people have used a double lumen? Let's, let's ask it that way. How many people have done a bronchial blocker? All right. Okay. <laughs> so, in terms of tube selection. Um, the nice thing about the double lumen tubes is that the same thing is bad about them as nice about them. The bad thing about them is that they're huge. They're big honking tubes and they're a challenge to get in sometimes. But it's good because there's sort of only one place it can go more or less in, in contrast to the, the blockers, which need a lot more precise uh, placement. And the other thing is that they will also help to empty the lung, right? Because the surgeon, what's the biggest thing the surgeon is going to complain about? The biggest thing, the lungs are up, the lungs are up, get the lungs down, right? You got this patient with COPD, they can't empty, <laughs> that's why they're here, buddy, they can't empty their lungs, right? And that's the biggest thing the surgeons complain about. And so when you put the, the double lumen tube in, you've got a big lumen through which that lung can then deflate passively. If you do a bronchial blocker, what have you just done? Block the ability for that lung to, to deflate at all. And it's, there's usually a little tiny port in those. So that's kind of a nice thing about the, the double lumen tubes. How about left versus right side? What are the pros and cons of those? Left side of bronchus or right side of bronchus? So right side should be easier to place because it's going to kind of go there. What's the big downside about the right side placement, though? That's right, the right upper lobe. So you recall that it, the, the angle is different, but then if you think about the distance, it's about two and a half centimeters off of the carina is where that right upper lobe is going to come off, which is going to be right about the spot that you're going to want your cuff to be. And if that cuff is sitting over that right upper lobe takeoff, now you've just excluded a, a lobe that, that you didn't want to exclude. Um, or you're not emptying a lobe that you wanted to empty one way or the other. So most commonly we use left-sided tubes for just about everybody, just because it's, it's easier to just kind of put it in and not have to worry about having to have the um, placement so precise. So typically left-sided tubes are used for most people. 26 through 32 French for smaller people, <coughs> 35, 37 for females of, of adult normal size, 39 and 41 French for males. Keep in mind though that, um, that when you do that, that there's still, even though the tube itself is huge, it's split in half, right? So it's still a, a smaller um, smaller diameter. So I mean, when you're putting in um, a 35, you say, well, let's put a 35 French tube, it's a woman, it, you have the diameter of about a five millimeter, five inch millimeter internal diameter and a tracheal tube. So, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a real benefit to trying to put a larger size tube in, which, of course, is the whole thing that led people to say, well, why don't we just put a big tube like we want and then put a bronchial blocker to block off the part, the, the lung that we didn't want to um, uh, ventilate. So that's kind of the ups and downs. So there's some nice benefits of the double lumen tube, but then there's some downsides to it as well, that ultimately you're putting the big, huge tube, but you're really only ventilating through a, I'm supposed to take like a pediatric size tube in the, in the end. Um, when you put this in, you put it in through the cords. You'll turn the tube toward the side of the, the, the lung, usually the left lung, uh, until that. Um, so there's the, the tracheal cuff is indicated there. So that'll exclude the, the everything above the trachea. Then the bronchial cuff, cuff, which is a low volume, high pressure cuff. Right? We don't want that one to be up too long. Uh, 
uh, will occlude that bronchus. So now you can just choose, you know, if you ventilate through the trachea lumen, then everything that's not blocked off, which is in this case going to be the right lung, is going to be ventilated. If you ventilate through the bronchial lumen, everything on that side, wherever, whichever side that in, that's in, is going to be ventilated. Initially, the idea was you put it in away from the, the side that, that you were going to operate on, but unless they're doing a pneumonectomy, you know, if they're working on the periphery of the lung, they're not going to get anywhere near that tube. It's not going to matter if that bronchial lumen is two centimeters into the left side, you know, the operative side or the non-operative side. It's not going to affect anything. So that's why we've kind of defaulted to, well, where's it easier to get it, to get it uh, situated without worrying about that right upper lobe takeoff, and that tends to be the left side. Um, so uh, then bronchial blockers. So we can use a single lumen tube with a bronchial blocker. We can use steerable uh, tubes, which is the Cohen, the non-steerable, which is that wire-guided tube that slips over your fiber optic. That, um, that we use, that, uh, that I talked about a second ago. Um, usually with these, you need a fiber optic. So we used to, and, and we use fiber optic more now for everything, but it used to be that with the double lumen tube, when I learned to do this, you stick it in, you clamp off one side and ventilate and say, no lung sounds there, lung sounds there. Then you clamp the other side, no lung sounds there, positive lung sounds there, and you go, we're done, we're good. Now it's more common to, to use the, the fiber scope. But to, to verify that placement. But with a bronchial blocker, you really have to because there's no way of otherwise of knowing exactly where that blocker sits. And you want that to sit just right beyond the, uh, the carina. Some of these, um, th and there's a variety of different uh, uh, versions of this out there. This thing is called the, um, what's this called, the easy bronch or something like that that you just kind of stick down there and, and it and just kind of gets hung up again. It, doesn't, it sounds kind of nasty, but it gets kind of hung up on the, um, on the carina, and then there are two balloons. You just blow up one or the other, and it doesn't really matter which way you put it in. You just decide to, you know, whichever one is, is ends up on the side that you want is the one that you leave up. Um, seems like a, a good idea. Seems like it'd be easier to, um, you know, to get it in, but it tends to come out of place uh, more easily than some of the other ones. The other downside, the biggest downside to the bronchial blockers, like I said, is that it, it, the lung tends not to deflate as well. And in patients with COPD, that's that's exactly the probably the challenge that you're going to have is getting the lung to deflate because that's what the surgeon uh, wants. So it takes longer time. We might have to put suction on. The, the, usually the, bron the blockers will have a little oxygen port that you can insufflate some oxygen through. You could also apply suction to that to help deflate the lung. Uh, the, bron the blockers cause less sore throat because you got not that big, huge honking thing, uh, not that big double lumen tube sitting in there. And uh, it may be, uh, may be easier for a difficult airway. So uh, if you've got a patient who looks like this, you're going to have a, it's going to be a challenge to put that bronchial blocker in there. They've got no chin or this person on the right side. What is that? That's like a malentotti, what, five, six, <laughs> you know? So that's a challenge. The, the double lumen tube is a challenge to start with because it's so big. And then, you know, if you add on top of that uh, a difficult airway, it gets even more so. Yeah. Oh yeah, and slip across the side that you're trying to ventilate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, and the saturation is dropping. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Are you on your anesthesia complication rotation now? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> so we've got you. <laughs> um, this is this is the um, the wire guided tube. So I'll show you. I've got a little video of that, which is kind of cool. So the the wire on the end of that blocker has already slipped over the the bronchoscope. Now the bronchoscope, you see, they they made their way down to the carina. And then they're, they're going to go down the bronchus that, that they want, looks like the, the left side there. And then they're just going to slip that, uh, slip it off. So slip it off the end of the, the um, scope. Then you want, ideally, so this is a perfect uh, follow-up there, is that you want that, the balloon, and no matter what kind of, whether it's a, uh, a dub lumen or a bronchial blocker, you want that balloon just right beyond the carina. Um, you have a little bit more leeway, obviously, on the left side, because you're going to have about five centimeters to hit that, uh, the, the second carina on the left side, the upper and lower lobe versus two and a half on the right side, but still 
if you keep it within view, then you always know where it is. If it gets too far down, then you, you never really know exactly. So you're, you're always best off just having it just be on. But the downside to that is that, just like Nick was saying, with patient movement or you wiggle the tube a little bit, if that comes out, now it's, it could be obstructed in the side that you're intending to ventilate, and, and then that's obviously not good. Now you got no lungs being ventilated. Um, and then this is that, uh, that easy blocker uh, going in. That one just goes in and kind of gets hung up uh, right on the, uh, on the trina. And then, and then you can just, so again, you're doing this on a direct view, so then you just, you've got two different ports that you use with a syringe, just blow up one or the other, whichever one works is the one that you, you keep uh, inflated. Uh, again, this one does, does tend to slip out, though. It seems like a great idea, but, but it, it didn't get great um, critical acclaim, as they say. Um, what about babies? So there's an issue right there. So they're smaller, there's gonna be less room for, um, for movement, how are we gonna do a, a, a one lung case in a baby? I love that look. The baby's like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Doesn't have that look. What are you about to do here? You guys are all crowding around me. What are we gonna do for a baby? Blockers? What else could you do? Teeny tiny, might, might be, might be not a lot of real estate there to get a blocker in. What else could you do? Any ideas? Say it. No. <laughs> it's like I'm not saying it. What do you think? Uh, so you could just tell the surgeon tough, work around it, right? Push, so it's a baby lung, push it out of the way. So you could do that. What else could you do? Do it. Probably too much. That's probably, oh, bypass is probably overdone for that. Just break main stem and just shove it down, just shove it right on down. You just want to ventilate one lung, whoop, we're ventilating one lung. <laughs> Pull it back, we're ventilating two lungs. You did that accidentally, right? End up ventilating two lungs, we're not ventilating two lungs accidentally. So you just, you just move it. Um, so there, there are a number of ways. Now, if the kids of a, of a size that you could do um, a bronchial blocker, here's how that would look. So this is from our uh, kids OR. So here was a little baby going off to sleep. Thankfully, they use a store so we can watch and play along. Nice view of the larynx there. Now, in this case, though, the, the blocker is not going to go inside the lumen of your tube, right? Because you, you don't have enough lumen to give up. So the blocker goes in first and then comes in the trachea tube. See that? So you place the blocker first, get that on the side that you want, then the, the endotracheal tube goes right down beside it since it's probably not gonna be a cuff tube anyway. And, uh, and, then, and then after positioning, okay, for the same reasons Nikki pointed out, after positioning, then get the first, then do the, the final placement, right? Because you get it placed, and take that little squirt and, whoosh, and move them, it's gonna be gone, it's gonna be out. So after they get, they, they just kind of put it there to, to, to hold it in place uh, until they get in position, then go in with a fibroscope and do the fine, um, adjustment for the placement of that blocker balloon. And that's just how that looks again, just right beyond the carina. All right, so you gotta go for that. Um, okay, so we decide what tube we're gonna use, we get the tube in, get it in place, get it working. Um, then what do we do in terms of maintaining our one lung ventilation? So let's talk about ventilation first. Um, Used to be that you know the old thinking was more volume is better, keep the lungs wide open, you know, so that you don't have atelectasis because we know we get atelectasis under anesthesia. And more recently, uh, physiology research has told us that's not a good thing. Lungs don't like being stretched out. And we used to talk a lot about barotrauma, avoid barotrauma, and now people realize even with the bar with the barometer okay, with the pressure fine, there's also volume trauma that the excess of stretch of the alveoli. Uh, causes exudate, causes cytokine uh, infiltration into the alveoli, and causes all sorts of badness. So, number one, keep the dependent lung open for business. You're right. So they're laying down here. We got this one lung we're ventilating. They probably already did, well, they got some disease, unless it was like a localized tumor. We're going to assume a lot of these patients are going to have COPD. Um, so it's already a diseased lung. Now they're laying to, uh, lateral. We said, what happens to the abdominal viscera when you lay lateral? That all is pushing on that particular lung, right? Because it's pushing down that way. So we have all these reasons the lung's not going to want to stay open. You want to get atelectasis in the in the basin. So we want to keep the lung open, um, but we don't want to overventilate. We don't want to cause volume trauma. We don't want to cause too much pressure. We don't want to cause a lot of pressure that makes a lot of zone one, uh, you know, and, and obstructs the flow. 
And then importantly, we don't want to go back and forth. We don't want to have some atelectasis and then open the lung up and then let the atelectasis of the burn open up because that shearing force of having those alveoli close up and open up is bad as well. So it's sort of like three different things we want to do. They're, they're all a little bit in opposition, you know, or, or all a little bit of a challenge for each other. Uh, but that's, that's uh, you know, what we're trying to do in the end. So um, we used to talk about larger tidal volumes. More recently people have realized, no, smaller tidal volumes are better for the lung itself. Um, and, you know, even to the extent of, you know, if the CO2 rises, uh, that's fine. You know, if you need to just kind of be a little permissive about the, the hypercapnia, that's fine in contrast to overstretching, overventilating the lungs and causing this uh, lung damage that's then going to hang around afterwards. Um, deep, good or bad? For sure, good, right? Because we want to keep the lung open for business. There's a lot of factors, a lot of, you know, things pushing up against the base of that lung trying to close it. So we want to use PEEP, but we don't want to use PEEP I. We don't want to have a lot of, of uh, inherent PEEP or intrinsic PEEP because they already, if they already have some uh, intrinsic PEEP. We, when we talked about that last week, I'm watching flow volume loops, you know, uh, dynamically and, and making sure that the flow is stopped before the next breath comes in and, and all that. Um, how about pressure versus volume? Which one do you think is better? Pressure. So this is one of those those perennial um, areas of controversy and anesthesia, um, and I'll give you three three um, divergent opinions. So this was uh, a um, an article that said, "Oh, pressure ventilation is better. You, you manage the pressure. You don't have these high pressures building up, and and uh, it's more gentle on the lungs." Um, here are a couple of, of uh, references that said it makes no difference whatsoever. Then this other group came out and said, well, it makes no difference, but it makes no difference because pressure is better, although you trade off some tidal volume, right? So you might lose some tidal volume if you're doing pressure. So the increased volume with volume in, it, it cancels out, you know, the, the lower pressure with pressure. This, this group uh, in, in journal Cardiothoracic uh, Vascular Anesthesia published a study that said even when they maintain pressure and volume and the, and the tidal volumes were normalized between the two groups, no difference. So the answer is probably whatever works, <laughs> it works. If one of them's not working, switch the other one. If that's not working, go to the other one. Um, there, there's not really any very clear, um, uh, you know, clear consensus on which mode is going to be best for certain, uh, certain circumstances. So really, I, I think that there again, you end up with a lot of like personal opinions. Well, someone told me once, or you know, this this might seem better for that. Um, I will say that you know the the the, the square waveform of the waveform, the flow waveform of the pressure ventilation, theoretically sounds like it makes a better. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be careful to be uh, evidence based here because it sounds like a good idea. But of course, we try not to say it sounds like a good idea. But it sounds like a good idea that if we're trying to keep the lung open and trying to keep these alveoli open, that it's probably better off to put a lot of, of flow in, you know, a high rate, as opposed to doing that sort of ramp flow that, that we see with the um, with the volume ventilation. But uh, like I said, you can find data that'll say both ways. If you want to find like um, what, what people typically publish and call open lung strategies, open lung ventilation strategies, when we keep lungs with alveoli open, this is typically what people will talk about. Oftentimes we'll say pressure, suggest pressure control, FiO2 at a moderate level, add some PEEP in automatically, keep the, the pressure at a, a manageable level, even to the extent of allowing some uh, uh, you know, hypercapnia, and shoot for a tidal volume of six mils per kilo on the left or eight mils per kilo on the right, again, uh, accounting for the, the different size of the individual lungs. If you're only ventilating one, uh, you might make some adjustments in terms of the size. That one lung at six mils per kilo is probably not going to you know, do a great job of keeping CO2 really low, but the trade-off is you're protecting lung tissue itself, and you're protecting the patient from having downstream uh, um, you know, damage to their lungs. And then, because you can blow the CO2 off later, it's not going to kill them. And then adjust the rate in the ID to try again, try to get the expiratory flow back to zero before the, the next uh, breath comes in. And you see the CO2 is the very last thing to mention on that, right? When all else is in place, then, then give a little bit of thought to the CO2. Um, here's another reference to that. Uh, again, they said tidal volumes four to six. They're talking about very low tidal volumes now in these diseased lungs. Routine PEEP though, and again, they said, you know, the heck with it, let the, let the CO2 do what it wants to do. Uh, again, it, it, it'll keep the blood pressure up, you know, it won't uh, probably, Probably. Um, all right, so anesthetic plan. What do we do for an anesthetic plan um, for these uh, patients? What do you think? What would be a good anesthetic plan? Or what have you used? What have you done? <laughs> 
-hmm. Okay. How about anesthesia wise? What would you use for from the surgeon to keep them asleep? Anything special? Yeah. Anything different from Mama? Do what? Epidural. Have you done that for intra-op? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a nice way to go. What else? Anyone do anything else? Uh, any other unusual? You have a lot of narcotics. Uh, why? <laughs> what might be the benefit of that? What might be the benefit of using a lot of opioids? Yeah, so that so that's usually if, if we're if we're shifting the balance toward the opioid side of things, it's usually for concern of trying not to mess up the HPV with the volatile or with any other um, uh, vasodilators. Um, but we'll I'll show you some data about that that talk about how how much an issue that is. Um, how much fentanyl are you supposed to use for lab coli? <laughs> Depends, right? I see. But how uh, how long before the end of the surgery do you turn the gas off? Depends. That's right. Um, what garment is essential for a long case of outbreak relief? <laughs> Thank you for playing along. Yeah. <laughs> as as with most things in anesthesia, right? It just it depends. There's not one single anesthetic uh, technique. The things to keep in mind are what? We, we're trying to keep the V and the Q matched, and the way that we match the V and the way the patient's going to try to match the V and the Q is through the HPV. They're going to try and vasoconstrict in the areas that aren't getting ventilated well, and so the only thing that we really have to be very concerned about is not messing that up. And so, uh, but traditionally, you know, the, the conversation then goes, so avoid the opioids, I mean, avoid the volatiles in favor of opioids because we don't want to give these vasodilators. However, the fact of the matter is, like with most things, if anything in moderation is, is generally going to be okay anyway. And so this is from, um, this is some data that, w that was published on that topic about um, the, the propensity for volatiles to inhibit the HPV. And so on the left side there is the percent control of HPV, so 100% control, so HPV is totally intact versus, you know, if, it, if that line goes down, it's not. But you see that at one, per at one max, it, it was still 75% intact. It would only drop it by 25%. And even at 2 mac, it would take 2 mac to even get below 50%, uh, 2 mac of desiccline. Who's ever going to use that? Who's going to be running 12% desiccline in another case, right? So the fact of the matter is it's a nice theoretical kind of idea, a nice idea to think about. Let's try not to give some vasodilators that might, might impair the patient's uh, inherent HPV ability, but at the same time recognize that with a typical, uh, you know, moderate uh, balance technique, it's probably not going to not going to cause a problem. How about nitrous? Good, bad, indifferent, avoid it, use it. What do you think? I've heard from people. Love it, yeah? So the idea there is, is we're trying to um, not mess up PO2, okay? So. Yeah, so the conversation about nitrous, so two things to think about with nitrous. So the one thing is, is just that if they've got, if they've got some flebs, if they've got baldness, baldness disease in the lung, you don't want to expand those spaces and, and potentially hurt them. And so that could be organ concerns, right? And that maybe you've got concern for, for maintaining the, the well of the <coughs> organ. At the same time, you know, you might say, well, what are the chances that's going to happen? What is the likelihood of that happening? And, and in contrast, if I've got this 80-year-old person Am I going to give them a bunch of opioids? Am I going to give them a full MAC of, of uh, volatile and probably let them wake up from that? Or looking at the bigger picture, the organism picture, might it be good if I find some balance, you know, and, and use some nitrous to balance out the volatiles? So again, um, you know, you'll hear a lot of different um, takes on this. Uh, probably, you know, I'd say if, if you don't need to use it, probably best not to use it. But it, it's not really an absolute positive uh, contraindication um, to um, 
to a patient who's undergone one lung anesthesia. So that's, uh, so that's our anesthetic plan. Now let's talk about uh, troubleshooting. So what happens then uh, when these tubes don't do what they're supposed to do? We're trying to keep the lungs uh, isolated. What happens when that doesn't work? Biggest thing that you're going to run into is the tube malposition, right? The tube's supposed to be isolating this lung and ventilating that lung, and, and it's not, not doing that for one reason or another. Um, so the, the first thing you think of is what? Something's in the wrong place. <laughs> something, something is definitely in the wrong place here. So, um, so the very first thing that we do is we look. And what are we looking for? What are we looking for? Look for the carina, and you want to see what? You want to see the balloon just on the other side of the carina. That's right. And so just like it's, it's indicated right there, what we're looking for. And then we can also look around, and, and you can look further down and see is, is there like a mucus plug? Is there some gunk in the, in the side that we're trying to ventilate, right? So that's what they're just kind of doing like just a regular exam there looking at the other side at the same time. You see the, the balloon is you know, looking like it's maybe a little bit closer to the carina side, and that might kind of expand or go down a little bit because it's just sort of right on the edge. Uh, but it looks like they were happy with it and, and came out and decided to leave it there. Then going down the other side again, just, just physiologically speaking, just looking to see, you know, is there, um, you know, is there a blockage of, of uh, being able to, uh, or there's right upper lobe bronchus, you see that? Uh, so that just shows, see where the tip of the tube is, is kind of obscuring that, that right upper lobe. Oh, no, sorry, we left side? I'm kind of lost here, I forgot where, which side they were looking down. Um, so looking, looking down is probably the first thing to do when you, uh, when you have an, an issue. When you have hypoxemia, what do we do? Do we, do we fix it or do we just crank the oxygen on? That's the question. You know, what, what's the best thing to do first? Fix it or diagnose it? You know, look, look down there and, and look. What do you think? Both at the same time. It's not a bad deal. Yeah. So look, look first is the message. <laughs> if the kid had looked first, he might not have crawled up the, the, <laughs> the slide. That's the reminder there. <laughs> so who does stuff like that? So uh, look first is usually the thing. So bronchoscopy to make sure the tube's in the right position. Make sure that you know you could clear secretions out if there's something blocking your ability to, to ventilate the patient. Then you could increase the FiO2. You could think about adding CPAP or intermittent ventilation to the non-dependent, the non-ventilated lung. Add or adjust PEEP to the dependent lung, the one that you are ventilating, uh, or do recruitment maneuvers. That's kind of the, the, the mantra of, you know, what are all the options I've got if the, um, if the oxygenation is not good. What's a recruitment maneuver look like? Grab your pressure, give them a big breath, hold it. A few minutes? <laughs> a few seconds. Okay. Yeah. Eight seconds. Good. Yeah. And so the idea again, we're trying to open the lung and keep it open. Now, ideally, we want to keep it open, right? Yeah, it's not, this, is this is a different kind of recruitment. Josh can relate to this. Different kind of recruitment maneuver, right? <laughs> so, um, did you get this kind of recruitment maneuver? Yeah. You're going to have a first class accommodations, down a little bit, right? Uh, <laughs> I think I'll drop from up front for the Marines. You know, do anything nice. So, um, so it's a slow maximum volume ventilation of the dependent lung, right? So you're trying to keep the lung open, trying to combat that atelectasis, give an inspiratory pause, keep it, keep it uh, open. Uh, and if oxygenation improves, you sort of diagnose the problem, right? So if oxygenation improves after that, you go, oh, yeah, we had some shunting going on. We had some atelectasis. Um, or else increase the tidal volume one way or the other, figure out how to do step number one, which is keep the lung open for business. Now, the other side of that coin, see what I did there? Is this. Recruitment maneuvers also, if you're, if you're giving that maximum volume ventilation, what's that going to do to the intrathoracic pressure? What's that going to do to your venous return? Right? So you're going to decrease it in this 80-year-old, you know, frail little granny who's got COPD. So you have to kind of do this judiciously and kind of figure out, you know, uh, what's, what's uh, you know, the, the best risk-benefit ratio. Also, again, I said that volume trauma is an issue. And so sometimes even doing these big recruitment maneuvers can cause that stretch that cause some of that cytokine uh, exudate into the lungs and, and uh, maybe cause some bad, uh, bad effects. So um, this, this article by Lum here in the British Journal of Anesthesia said, you know, it's not very good because it's just a, a temporary uh, fix, you know, when you do a recruitment maneuver. Because what they did, again, you, you can't just take the, it's like, you know, it's in that stuff to all year. You can't just take the result and go, oh, yeah, they found, they discovered this. You got to say, well, how did they discover that? Or what led them to that conclusion? Because in this case, 
they took patients under one lung anesthesia, they got to the end of the case, they did a recruitment maneuver, and then right before they extubated the patient, when they extubated the patient, they got to the PACU, and they said, it didn't work. Saturation, you know, wasn't very good. Well, it's not really supposed to work that way. I mean, if, if you can do the recruitment maneuver, but then you gotta keep it open. You know, you gotta do that and then add the PEEP on top of it or add the pipe bomb on top of it. So if you do that and then extubate them and let the pressure go to zero, is not surprising that they're, they're gonna go back to the atelectatic uh, state that they were in a minute ago. Um, so some found the effects might be transient, but then this other one, this, this um, article by uh, Park there, said uh, no, they found that, that uh, recruitment maneuvers were actually um, very effective and, and did, uh, you know, did maintain the, um, the PO2 uh, elevated. Um, so then um, in terms of oxygenation and ventilation, so then where do we need to go with that? Should we start with 100% O2? I mean, disease lungs, why not? Absorptive atelectasis is one issue with that. What's another issue with that? Free radicals, oxygen toxicity. What's another very practical problem with that? You got nowhere else to go, right? If you start 100, you got nowhere else to go. It's really nifty if you need a temporizing measure if they're starting to, to drop. Roll that that flow meter up, you know, while you're figuring out and fixing, you know, whatever else needs to be done. So, um, in general, if the, in terms of hypoxemia, res responding to hypoxemia, the oxygen should be helpful. But um, but again, keep in mind that um, that at the same time, the whole issue what was the central, whole big central issue. The very first picture I showed when I introduced this topic is we've got a what. We got VQ on one side, we got Q on the other side. That means by definition, we got a, you know, usually about a 20 or 30% shunt that's gonna persist because the HPV is gonna do its job, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna close off the blood flow. So you're gonna end up with a 20 or 30% shunt. How do, how do shunts respond to oxygen? They don't, right? So if you have a significant shunt, the oxygen is probably gonna be minimally helpful, you know? So just keep in mind that it, sometimes there's a nice kind of temporizing measure, let's throw some, throw the FiO2 up, but also recognize that it might have a, a limitation uh, given the, the fact that, you know, they've got some shunting going on by definition. Um, and why not give 100% oxygen always? That's all there, just, just cover that. Then the other thing that we can do is that we can aerate the non-dependent lungs. So if we kind of get back to the source, so then the problem is that we've got a shunt. We've got some perfusion going through this operative lung that they're working on, but we're not ventilating it. That makes the shunt, that makes, that makes them hypoxemic systemically. Well, then the easiest, the most direct fix for that is one of two things. What are the two things that we can do to fix that? We could, wait, just the really big picture. We got perfusion but not ventilation. What are the two things that we can do to fix that? We can add, what? Ventilation, or we could decrease perfusion, right? Very simplistically, right? Very simplistically, we can either add ventilation or decrease perfusion, and then the V and the Q are gonna come closer together. So we usually do that by thinking about adding the ventilation, adding more V, and so we can use that to either prevent or treat hypoxemia if we aerate the lung even sometimes small amounts, sometimes even just a little bit of a puff, you know, just puff the lung up a little bit and leave it, um, will be good enough to kind of, you know, remember they'll just hold on to that FRC and, and it'll continue to, to, to aerate the blood that comes through there. Um, but at the same time, small amounts can sometimes, you know, cause a surgeon's little bit of, of heartache. And so even small amounts can sometimes explore the surgical field. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a pro and a con to that um, um, in terms of the benefit of, of using that. Uh, and the surgeons, you know how you know how nice they are when things are not like really beautifully perfect, you know, in their surgical conditions. So that's always the other thing too, is that when you have to ventilate that lung, and they're like, the lung's coming up, why is the lung so big? I gotta get in here. So you know that that sometimes is a little bit of a negotiation. Um, ventilate the non-dependent lung in conjunction with the surgeon. There are four, right? So either in conjunction with the surgeon, or at least behind their back. <laughs> so you wait until they turn around to pick up an instrument and then you ventilate it and then just like, and then just leave it, right? Clamp it off again. And then when they feel like, this lung seems to be coming up, then you just go, yeah, I know. I think you caused a lot of edema there, <laughs> right? So one way or the other, but sometimes you might, it, sometimes that's the last resort and you just have to tell the surgeon, look, I need to puff the lung up a little bit. You know, can you just deal with me for a minute uh, and let me just, you know, get some air in there. Um, you can go big, you can just tell the surgeon, Stop what you're doing for a second. I just got to put some air in that lung, puff it up, get rid of some of the atelectasis. And again, it's going to, you know, then you clamp it off again and, and you can let that stuff just sort of sit there. It'll act as a little FRC. So it doesn't have to be like, oh, we're just going back to two lung ventilation. 
or you could go small. And this is a really cool, um, this is a, a cool uh, publication that someone did because it's very kind of MacGyverish, which I love that kind of stuff in the OR. Is what they did is they uh, they want to put little bits of, of oxygen into the lung, and so on the the non -op, on the operative side on that upper lumen there of that uh, of that endotracheal tube, which looks like it's probably the, the one that went the bronchial lumen, they put a humid event. The humid event had a um, a lure port on on it, to which they hooked, uh, which was supposed to be for like gas sampling, but instead they hooked an oxygen tube, right? So go in the other direction turn the oxygen flow meter on at two liters per minute, and then uh, when you don't do anything, the oxygen is just gonna go in and then out the big, the big hole, right? It's, it's gonna come, it's, on the, it's, it's gonna just come right out, right where the person's finger is, right? If they put their finger on the hole, then what's, what's that gonna do? It's gonna divert the oxygen where? Down into the lung. And so it's a really nifty way of just having like a very uh, like small amount of oxygen that, so you know, when, when I was uh, a young anesthetist, we used to do this by sticking the oxygen tube down the, um, down the lumen and put some cotton wads in there. So that was a very ghetto way of, of doing this. This is much more upscale, you know, sort of way that, that when you need a little bit of oxygenation, just kind of you know, close, that, close it off, divert some oxygen into the lung, that'll sit there for a while. And, and so it's a really nifty way to put little bits of oxygen in there. Or you can go really small. You, and some uh, people have, have um, published this use in uh, jet ventilator to just jet some oxygen way down there, and you know without a lot of volume, the jet will have that venturi effect to kind of really pull much further than, than what you'd expect for the total amount of volume that goes in. Um, but again, in, in this study, they know that, that sometimes the, even that amount of lung movement is sometimes um, uh, not very uh, pleasant for the surgeons. And of course, it's not gonna remove the CO2 in the same way as if you did intermittent ventilation and then kind of let it off. So you know, part of that is kind of working with your surgeon to see what they're uh, amenable to um, you know, and what they can tolerate uh, in terms of the, their surgical exposure. So that's kind of kind of the word on troubleshooting. Then postoperatively, we'll talk just a little bit about some of these post-op complications. You know, these patients are going to maintain some uh, insult after the after a one lung anesthesia. You, know, you just can't have one lung kind of flattened like that. Another lung doing all the work of the first lung uh, of both lungs, and then have the you know take it off, they put them back on two lung ventilation, just think that they're going right back to, um, you know, to a normal state. So we know that there is a, um, there's a, a bit of a, a irreversible insult that occurs where the patients maintain a little bit of, of um, um, uh, hypoxemia. Uh, irreversible insult, sort of like this one, like when you say to a woman, like, what do you do? And she says, I'm not pregnant. That's an irreversible insult, right? <laughs> it's one of those things. You, it's going to be there. There's no, there's, there's no way to take it back. You guys have a story about this? When he did that, <laughs> oh, nice. converted her. Maybe you did a, a good service for her in the long run. <laughs> Set her on the planet fitness. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. The rule is, <laughs> my rule is, unless the baby is crowning, that's when I can ask. <laughs> that's when I feel comfortable asking. <laughs> so, so anyway, we know that, uh, that they have this, uh, there, there's this irreversible insult that even after you come back on a too long ventilation, it's not as easy as to say, oh, we just puffed the lung back up and now it's all good. And there was a study that, that talked about that, that, that this, yeah, the Tozen study, they found that, that even afterwards, the dependent lung, the one that you've been really in all the time, had a VQ in, in like the 0.3 to 0.5 uh, ratio. So there's some sort of, you know, I mean, it's taken on the, it's taken on the entire workload of the whole, you know, both lungs for that period of time. And, you know, undergoing all these pressure changes and stuff with the abdominal visceral pushing up against it. So, um, so sometimes, uh, I guess the message there is in spite of our best efforts, sometimes you've got to get the patient the pack here. They're just not going to have a great saturation. They're not going to be really high on their PO2, and, and that's just going to be the way it goes. Um, so uh, just a point or two about kind of where then we're going to go with all this is uh, some of the things that are kind of coming down the pike in terms of uh, research. 
is looking at, we've always put a lot of emphasis on trying to increase ventilation to that operative lung because we're trying to get the begin the queue back together. More research is coming out and, and more uh, pharmacology is kind of available now to think about, well, let's forget about the V, let's decrease the Q. And so uh, there's use of things like nitric oxide to, to uh, vasodilate and bronchodilate on the operative side, so trying to bring more V where there's already Q. But there's also this, uh, that drug Almatrine is a drug that enhances the HPV. So you can sort of you know, bring that balance together either way. You can either increase the one or, or decrease the other. And that's something that some research is being done on to, to try to enhance the HPV, meaning reduce the, the perfusion of the operative lung where there's already no ventilation. Um, we talked about this before, that the, end of, that the end house CO2 is fairly inaccurate, and so some of the research is looking at, at more uh, reliable means of, of monitoring um, end tidal CO2, since we know that these patients with lung disease tend to have a, have a widened gradient of that, and, um, and trying to get a better understanding of the significance of, of hypoxemia and the effect site monitoring. So in other words, is the saturation of 92 bad? Is the sat of 90 bad? Is the sat of 88 bad? At what point is it really bad, and, and is it maybe that if the fingertip has a sat of 88, you know, if, if we were doing near-infrared spectrometry of the brain, maybe that would be perfectly fine, you know, and so those are some of the areas that, that the research is kind of going with this. Um, so um, that's pretty much um, what we've got to cover regarding one lung anesthesia, talking about that big BQ. We'll let the learned spasms kind of sing us on out of here. All right, so um, questions about that? Questions, experiences to share? Interesting anecdotes. Thanks for yours, that was a good one. <laughs> no? Okay, well then, I will bid you farewell. Um, Courtney's reviewing exams and, and looking at the statistics and all that stuff on that. The, the, Slides on trolley and taco. Just look over those at, at your convenience. So it's really pretty straightforward. Just have an awareness of those two uh, syndromes of, of lung damage that can occur. One related to, to circulatory overload, the other related to uh, blood transfusion. And um, and then um, have a lot of I'll see you all. In